Welcome to Linux 2024. Mm -hmm. This is Lamash Kumar. He's going to be talking about securing IoT devices. I'll make it short. Thank you. Hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Lomash Kumar. Welcome to the talk, uh, Securing the IoT Frontier, Addressing Challenges in Low Power Devices. And I couldn't have asked for a better setup. Like when I entered this room, there are so many devices lying around. It all speaks IoT to me. Um, so, a little bit about me. So I have two decades of uh, software and hardware engineering experience with me. I'm a senior staff engineer right now with a company called Samsara. Uh, its sticker symbol is IoT, right? So uh, very interesting. They are doing very interesting work in this space. Uh, if you're interested, uh, you can reach out to me about them or, or just look them up. Uh, today, my talk is not about my employer, so I'll, I'll skip over. Uh, and uh, well, uh, in the past, I have worked for Amazon. So up until January, I was with AWS IoT. As you can uh, see from the name, uh, IoT is the, uh, AWS IoT is the IoT arm of AWS. I think of it as a platform that other IoT businesses like Samsara uh, are using to build their applications. Uh, an example is iRobot, right? iRobot, uh, they make the Roomba vacuum cleaners. Uh, they are on AWS IoT. Uh, my focus is, is mostly in security. Even before moving to IoT, I was in security. Uh, within IoT, uh, also focused on security a lot. Um, things around device identity. Uh, and whatnot. I have several patents in that space. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about one of them today. And um, I'm a mentor and I blog as well. Uh, and a disclaimer, uh, everything in the slides today are, are my personal uh, viewpoints based on my own experiences, does not represent the policies or business practices of my employers, uh, current or previous. Now, who is this talk for? I believe the talk is for everybody. Like IoT concerns everyone. And everybody has smart lights in their homes these days. The vehicle I drove today is internet connected. Right? I can take out my phone and check if I really lost it or not. And, and I'm sure a lot of you do too. So I think the IoT in general concerns everybody. Uh, but if you are a software or a hardware engineer, this talk is specially for you. Um, we are going to portray IoT as the next frontier for engineers, right? There are novel problems there that need to be solved. We'll inspect the unique circumstances and challenges within IoT today. And we'll scratch the surface of engineering problems and solutions, right? All of those solutions are really uh, engaging and so we will only be able to scratch the surface today not not deep dive into them, but happy to take questions uh, after it if uh, you all have them. So let's start with demystifying IoT a little bit. Uh, how do you guys think I created this image? And any guesses? Yep. AI. Yes, it's some form of AI. Yeah, I, I use Dolly, uh, which is a chat GPT plugin. You give it a prompt and it, it creates. Uh, so I was trying to create a futuristic image of, of IoT, how the future would look like. Uh, and if you look closely, uh, you would see smart homes, right? Uh, smart thermostats, smart locks, smart lighting. You would see smart factories. Right, also known as industrial IoT. I spent some time in industrial IoT recently. Um, so things like predictive maintenance of equipment, uh, industrial robots, asset tracking, those kind of things. You also see smart variables, right? So fitness trackers, smart glasses, things like that. Smart vehicles, smart cities. So in smart cities, you'd have um, waste management systems, water quality monitoring, uh, those kind of things. Smart healthcare. Uh, my favorite is 
smart pills and sensors to monitor medication adherence, right? Yeah, guess how that works. Smart agriculture, smart retail, and the interesting thing is that none of these things are science fiction today, right? While the image itself is futuristic, all of those things that I've listed are a reality, uh, and which just very exciting for me personally. How does a typical connected thing work, right? At, at the heart of all of it is an IoT platform that on one end connects to the humans or control <coughs> systems from where they receive their instructions, commands, where they report back their status. And on the other hand, the IoT platform connects to smart devices. Uh, smart devices receive commands from the IoT platform and report their status too. Now, the way humans interact with an IoT platform is not very different from how humans interact with web in general. You would have a mobile app or a web browser or something like that to interact with the IoT platform. Anytime you are asking your smart light to turn on or turn off, most likely you are interacting with the IoT platform, not the device directly. The device receives that information from the IoT platform. So we are not going to focus a lot on this today because I, th I think that's not really IoT in my mind, right? The real IoT is there, right? How devices interact with the IoT platform and what goes on there. So a lot of the talk would focus on that. Let's, let's go deeper into that a little bit. Um, here in the image you are seeing uh, a product called AWS IoT Developer Button. Uh, this was built in 2018. Uh, I was uh, the team lead that uh, built this button. I was mostly on the software side, but we were also responsible for getting the right hardware built with our hardware partners. Uh, and um, interesting stories uh, from <clears throat> that time. But, but on this slide, I'm going to focus on how typically an uh, IoT device connects mm -hmm. to an IoT platform. Uh, on the right side, I have the logo of AWS, which represents the IoT platform in this image. Uh, when you click this button, it opens a connection to the IoT platform. Then there is a TLS handshake that happens. Um, and during the TLS handshake, a lot of data is exchanged, including uh, message digests, encryption, decryption, things like that are happening. And eventually, the button is able to send the information that I was clicked. And the platform acknowledges back saying, yes, I receive your click, at which point the button would show an LED light, showing green means success, red means some kind of an error. There are blinking patterns, which can tell you uh, what kind of error exactly. And then eventually, uh, the connection is closed. It's a battery powered device, as you can see, no uh, electrical wire going into it in this image. So essentially, the point I'm trying to make is that IoT devices are full-fledged computers, right? They need to do network connections. Uh, they need to implement complex encryption algorithms. They need to interpret serialized, deserialized messages over the network, interpret what's coming from the real world as well as from uh, IoT platforms and uh, all of that. So let's go and see how these devices are made. What, what goes into the manufacturing of these devices and, and their life cycle in general. I have a question. Yep. Do these devices connect directly to uh, like a cloud platform or is there a hub like in um, <clears throat> Like in the house or in the in the building that it connects as a um, like as a proxy point. This one particularly would connect directly to an IoT platform, not through an hub. Okay. It it would because this is a Wi-Fi device in this example. It would need uh, a Wi-Fi router. Okay. Uh, but there are devices uh, which can connect to a hub and then through yeah, that. Yeah, there's like a couple of different patterns, but yeah. Okay. Yeah. I just wanted to clarify what we're doing. Mm -hmm. 
So the life cycle of an IoT device uh, begins when the thing is conceptualized, right? And uh, like any other product, right? Uh, the conceptualization happens and then the prototype, right? So during the prototyping phase, engineers like me <coughs> would use hardware platform um, like Arduino or, or Raspberry Pi to test out their idea, right? They'll write custom software on top of that platform. Um, they'll use stack that comes with that hardware and they'll prototype their product and see if it works, right? Like a proof of concept. Then the thing goes through mass manufacturing. And during mass manufacturing, uh, everything that comes off of the uh, manufacturing line is tested. It goes through a supply chain. Now, what do I mean by supply chain here? Uh, an IoT device goes through multiple manufacturers when it is being manufactured. The first one, right, uh, would be the silicon vendor, the one who manufactures the chip that goes into the device. So say ST Microelectronics, for example, right, they manufacture a chip, and then that chip is used by another manufacturer who builds the body of the IoT device, to who, who builds peripherals like a button or an LED or, or a slot where the battery can go and build all of that into an IoT device. And, and this could be broken down in by case by case uh, across multiple more manufacturers, but to simplify, let's say those are the two. And then it goes to uh, a supplier who would stock these and sell these. So all of that makes up the supply chain of an IoT device. And then it is deployed. And deployments are by far the most interesting uh, stage in the life cycle of an IT device, right? <coughs> installation is non-trivial because when an IoT device is installed, it has to be installed on specific locations. If it's a thermostat, right, you have to install it in a specific place in your house. If it's a camera, it has to face a certain way. If it's a sensor, right, it has to go at a specific place. If, uh, so depending upon what it is supposed to do, right, the installation is usually non-trivial. And then integration, right? So a Wi-Fi device would need to be integrated to your Wi-Fi router. Maybe these devices would need to connect to an Ethernet line. Uh, industrial sensors which go on equipment, they need to be integrated to other signals that are coming from that equipment and so on and so forth. So there are integrations that happen and then there's contextualization. A light bulb in my bedroom is called my bedroom light. A light bulb in your office might be called my office light and so on and so forth. So the thing with IoT is that it has to know where it is in its environment. It has to be meaningful to its user and that's called contextualization. And how is all of that done, right? You can imagine a human with a mobile phone scanning QR codes on these devices and installing them, integrating them, contextualizing them one by one. These things are operated, right? So, so somebody is monitoring them for, for their health. Hardware repairs could use things like, uh, well, simply they need a battery replacement, could be a hardware repair there could be uh, more uh, engaged hardware repairs as well, depending upon whether the IoT device is expensive and we can invest into repairing it or it's use and throw. And software updates. So software updates are really crucial because uh, we find vulnerabilities in software we use almost on a daily basis and we have gotten used to patching these things uh, almost uh, like every month or so. So software updates, need to be supported for IoT devices. And then decommission. So before you throw out your IoT device, hopefully you are sanitizing the data, like you're erasing the Wi-Fi password you, you saved on it, and, and you're recycling the silicon. So all of that uh, makes up the life cycle of an IoT device. Now, how many IoT devices are we building, really? Right? Let's talk this, about the scale of it. Any, any guesses in the room? Yep. Very good. 500 billion by 2030? 500 billion? That's a good guess. 
Any other guesses? So we had 15 billion uh, connected devices in 2023, and, and it's predicted to go to 30 billion by 2030. So end of this decade, we are, we are already halfway uh, in this decade. And 30 billion is, is a big amount as well, right? Compared to the number of humans, that's four times the number of humans here. And you know, it's not that every human has four devices. Right, uh, the, the distribution is very skewed. Um, no surprises here, we use the most IoT devices in this country. The second uh, would be, well, I'm, I'm guessing North America means, means us and, and maybe Canada. And then Western Europe comes second and then the rest of the world. So that's the scale uh, of IoT devices. Yes? I have a quick question. Yeah. Um, in my general belief, I see, because mostly it's commercially advantageous, that IoT seems to be suggested that it is irrevocably connected to a cloud. And uh, very often, it would be uh, far better in many ways for it to be self-hosted by the company or the house or whatever by having their own box. And when you say make comments like but their own, um, uh, connectivity box. Mm -hmm. And I'm, when you say things like this, are these estimates broad enough to encompass all worlds, or is this just what uh, somebody wants to be told uh, to somebody at AWS is their market? Uh, how, how, do, how do you look at that from that point of view? Well, uh, there are definitely devices that can be self-hosted, mm -hmm. right? And, and they make up a big chunk of the IoT spread out there. Actually, from my experience of industrial IoT, I can tell you that a lot of industrial customers, like for example, a car manufacturer, doesn't want critical equipment in their factory to fail because they got disconnected from the internet, mm -hmm. right? Uh, sending all of data to the cloud is, is not always beneficial, right? And, and sometimes the data needs to reside locally where it is generated for compliance reasons. So there are many reasons for these things to just never be connected to the internet. So you're right. But at the same time, like I, I think that as a, definitely as a spectrum, but also as a ramp up as a civilization, right? There was a time when we all believed that having DVDs in our backyard was the only way to have a collection of movies, right? But today nobody has that, right? And it was, it was, very impractical economically and logistically to have all your movies online because it was expensive to, to rent space online and it was expensive to download and stream those movies on demand, right? But as those things become more secure, more financially viable, I think there are obvious benefits of having everything connected all the time. Right, so I do personally believe that that is the future where we are headed towards. But I cannot deny that yes, some people are pushing this envelope just for their commercial success. That's true too. Well, I mean, I, 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 you, you brought up the light and, and you know, having a remote control for turning your light on. It doesn't have a security issue, but very often it's sort of like, okay, I can't control my light on the table that's across the room without it going through uh, a network connection to, to AWS or whatever. And that seems yeah. dumb to me. Yeah, 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 absolutely. But just to confirm, these numbers include all IoT, right? Whether that's local or remote. Well, that's what I'm basically starting to ask. Yes, yeah, yeah. These, these, these are all connected devices, not necessarily connected to the internet. So with that scale in mind, right? Uh, 30 billion devices in 2030, right? Uh, how did that change the life cycle? of an IoT device? Well, uh, the mass manufacturing is already at a stage where, where humans have 
a no touch policy for everything that is coming out of the manufacturing line right we have like i, I think for a couple of decades now we have gone out of practice of checking or testing everything manually which comes out of the manufacturing line so that's like no change there i would say but the deployment right and and doesn't matter if it is connected to the internet or not right you can't expect humans to scan barcodes on these devices individually and deploy them if i have hundreds of them in my backyard even even if i have 50 of them i don't want to do it right i don't want to do it for a dozen of them right to be honest so installation integration and contextualization would become automated and those are very interesting problems right mm -hmm. how does the device know that it's in your bedroom versus it's in your office and i'll i'll, I'll touch upon those problems in later slides a little bit. Um, the way we operate IoT devices uh, would become much like how we operate a large fleet of servers in the cloud today. Right? So anybody who has done uh, fleet monitoring uh, for cloud devices knows that when you have like a hundred hosts running a service in the cloud, you don't depend on, on humans to detect problems. Right? You have automations there. You have uh, machine learning algorithms, detector logic that surfaces anomalies for humans to handle. We manage things by exception now. When things are running fine, or when they seem to be running fine, we don't go in and, and look at things anymore. And that's how IoT is going to be as well, right? Things that are running in your house will just simply run until they create problem and you have to go in and look at them. I have a question about, um, like, um, in, a lot of cases, hardware gets refreshed every couple of years, like my, my enterprise laptop every couple of years. You know, hardware's changing, and you know, my cell phone, you get a new cell phone every couple of years or a year or something like that because um, the software stuff that is needed to run on them, you know, hardware changes. What do you see, uh, are you gonna get into like hardware refreshes of IoT devices? That seems like a really challenging problem. Like you build something, and then, like, how do you update it when you've got new models and you've got new, um, you know, network protocols or things like that that you might need to to change? Um, you know, that seems like a kind yeah. of challenging problem. It, it's definitely challenging. I, I don't think I don't think the industry is aiming at solving that problem. Right? We are gravitating towards a model where IoT devices are more use and throw. Right? Uh, mm -hmm. we, we might even patch software to a minimal level where we are fixing bugs or fixing holes in what we have shipped, uh, major upgrades of software are, are likely going to be dependent on hardware aspects of the device as well. And those things happen with a new version of the product. So do you think like um, the like stuff that's been deployed out there will just stay and exist as long as it's viable and like it will be maintained Compatibility will be maintained for as long as um, possible, yeah. and then you know new versions will be like you gotta buy a new device or something like that to get the new features. Or... Yeah, yeah. While IoT have this computer aspect to it, and we expect it to upgrade like our computers, right? They also have the thing aspect to it, right? Yeah. So think of them as as your light bulbs or your fans, and how frequently you upgrade them. Yeah. Right, and, and and those constraints hold for IoT devices, uh, same as the constraints that come from its computer aspect. Right? Yeah. It has two parents, like one parent is the is the computer parent, and the other parent is the thing parent. Yeah. And and so it has inherited both of those constraints. Right. Um, and and hopefully, as we scale, we will still be uh, diligent with sanitization and, and recycling, right? We don't want to create mm -hmm. uh, a big dump of, of IoT devices that are end of life and, and mm -hmm. rotting in a corner. Um, so let's talk about some tangible uh, results from my uh, past life, things I've come across, things I've done uh, that relate to the scale, the unprecedented scale that IoT is going through and some of the changes that we're expecting. And most of them are around deployment in 
in my case because because that's the area where uh, I was focusing. How many of you have heard about frustration free setup? Uh, it's a it's a term used by Amazon, uh, but it's not really uh, the 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 idea is not specific to Amazon. Um, frustration free setup is about uh, not being frustrated as you deploy an IoT device. A very simple idea, right? You want the IoT device to be in a working condition, to work out of the box, right? Uh, you, you unbox it, you turn it on, and it works. You, you don't have to like long press it, put it in some pairing mode, give it your Wi-Fi credential, tell it you are my bedroom light bulb, and then uh, all of that, right? It, it just works. But for it to simply work, what you have to do is, uh, well, the, the way this solution has, has uh, evolved is when you turn on a device, the device asks the other devices in the room about the context, right? So a device asking other device, hey, what's the Wi-Fi password you are using? What's the SSID, right? Which room are you in? Who's the user? What, what account ID are you associated with? Things like that. And the device which has this information shares this information with this new device, right? And, and that's how this new device works out of the box. And it's frustration free for, for humans. But the security enthusiasts among us, right? I mean, they would, they would be nervous when, when they hear this. This thing has been working now since 2018. Um, this, another example is, uh, this is a patent that I filed, uh, and uh, this is more about contextualization. So when a device boots up and detects that it does not have uh, contextualization information, it would connect to other devices and ask if you are in a bedroom or, or in a drawing room or whatever tags are associated with you and, and share it. So uh, just trying to show that the industry is already aware of the problem where there are just too many devices for, for us to go and deploy manually. And we are looking for automated ways of doing it. So let's do a quick recap, right? Uh, and we have more slides after that. So IoT is everywhere. It depends on on-device and network security. So in, in the button example, if you remember that slide, the device was trying to do a TLS handshake with the cloud. During a TLS handshake, uh, the messages exchanged between the device and the platform can be seen as the network security. And, and the private keys for the TLS handshake needs to be secured on the device itself, right? Because if those private keys are not secure enough, anybody would be able to read it out and then pretend to be your light bulb on the internet and you don't want that. So, so IoT needs to have these kinds of security built in. IoT will see unprecedented scale in this decade. And humans have decreasingly few touch points with these devices. Right? And all of this is, is just a ramp up to the conclusion that security implementation in IoT devices must be robust and comprehensive, right? Yes. A question about the, um, I guess, not so much contextualization, but more of the devices beginning to connect with, say, your home network. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned that they're Wi-Fi devices, but they may reach out to other devices locally to figure out you know, what the Wi-Fi credentials are. Mm -hmm. In your experience, what has been you know, kind of the method of doing that? Is it like station to station, like peer to peer type from one device to another? Is it out of band and Bluetooth? And regardless of that, like, how do they know, like, you know, if I'm a new device in my whole network and I'm reaching out, how do I know that my peer is actually someone who is in my, I guess, home network? Uh, well, a lot of this, so to answer your second question first, uh, a lot of that is dependent on proximity, okay. right? Uh, if something is reachable over Bluetooth, most likely, right? Probabilistically, it's probably in the same room, at least in the same house. And we still depend on humans to do the final okay on, on it. So 
it is frustration free to the extent that humans don't have to search and dig for things but they still have to do an okay at the end um, and yes, uh, to answer your first question, um, a lot of that is peer-to-peer. -peer. So in case of Wi-Fi, what a device would do is it would broadcast a Wi-Fi SSID and uh, other devices know what is the discovery protocol. So they are looking for that SSID. And when they see it, they know there is a newbie in the house and it needs to be onboarded. Okay. So it's a very collaborative... So the device itself is broadcasting out? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Right. Okay, let's move a bit faster. So uh, now the second chapter of this talk is about uh, low-powered hardware and the bespoke software that is being built for IoT, and all of that makes security harder. Right. So the first chapter was we need more security for IoT, and the second chapter is well, it, it's inherently hard because cheap hardware and, and bespoke software. Um, these are the examples of the chips uh, that are being used these days uh, for building IoT. These are the most popular ones, but not the only ones. Right? Um, both are from Espressive. Uh, the ESP8266 came out in 2014. That's on my right. And on my left, uh, when I'm looking at you, is ESP32 which came in 2016. Uh, between the two, I would guess there are a billion devices out there. Um, and if you look at the, the spec, right, it's, it's a joke when you compare it to what your laptop can do, right? So IoT devices need to be more secure than your laptop. Like your laptop would never share credentials with other laptops in the room, right? So it's, it's, it's already, closed on a lot of fronts where where IoT devices are not. And so IoT devices need to be more smart about sharing things, more smart about how they implement security and all of that. So clearly we are saying IoT devices need to be more secure. But at the same time, we are saying IoT devices are also uh, less powerful. So, so that brings us to the elephants in the room, right? I'm, I'm trying to move a little bit fast here, but uh, so the two elephants in the room are the things I summarized, right? So what you really need is, is a way to, to make both of these happy, right? We want to be able to have more security and we want to be able to do cheap hardware because 30 billion of them are to be made by 2030. And, and trust me, like nobody wants to spend a single penny more than they have to. The only way to... Yeah, I, I like this, this image a lot. All of this is DALI, by the way. Uh, the only way to make these two elephants happy is, is smart engineering, right? We have to be more innovative, right? Uh, especially engineers who are looking at web right now, right? They might sometime feel, and this is a very personal opinion, I sometimes feel that maybe web technologies are are hitting a point where we don't need these kind of innovations anymore. Like, sure, everybody wants things to be better, but but I think the web learning curve for our society in general is is at a hunky dory place. Like, things are not pushing us to to go further. But in IoT, that's not the case, right? And in IoT, there is still a, a, a lot of demand for smart engineering and out of box thinking. Uh, so in the next few slides, I'm going to talk about three challenges, engineering challenges that emerge out of this tug of war between the two elephants, right? Need more security, but the, the hardware is, is not that powerful enough. One of them is secure boot. So lack of physical security demands secure boot, right? Uh, I don't think I need to convince anybody here about that because we are at Linux Fest. Um, popular solutions like UEFI uh, are not needed to IoT, right? So a laptop, any laptop here, I would bet, has secure boot built into it, but IoT devices don't uh, usually because the stack 
uh, well, first of all, there is no standard stack for, for IoT, right? For, for PCs, you can say, are you using Mac, are you using Linux, or are you using um, Windows? But for IoT, there are like 20 different stacks that you can use. And so there, there is no standard. And, and so there are no standard solutions that you can expect to build on top of as engineers when you, when you start working with a stack. And so you have to build these things yourself. If you're building an application in IoT, right, don't uh, expect Secure Boot to work out of the box. You'll have to do something about it. Um, okay. Um, secure communication is, is the next one. So IoT devices are expected to use low bandwidth. And uh, like th this, this is the sibling of the other button that I talked about earlier. It uses LTEM to talk, up, talk to the IoT platform. And it needs to be low bandwidth. And it only needs to send one byte of data on every click, right? The, like the, mem the amount of data you need to send to report that I was clicked is one byte. It's, it's less than that, but, but I'm rounding up, right? But the TLS handshake itself is few kilobytes, right? So that's the kind of overhead that IoT devices have to face when they have to consider security, right? To send one byte of data, I have to send a thousand times more information just to establish a secure connection before I can do what my business wants me to do. So that's a challenge. Yeah, I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. Sorry. That's about all the time we have tonight, guys. Thank you all for coming out so much. Do you have a uh, contact slide or anything at the end? Um, no, I, I don't have a contact slide, but um, I was going to give out my, my uh, email address for anybody who's interested to, to reach out. Uh, that would be my last name, which is Kumar, K-U-M-A-R, dot Lomash, my first name, L-O-M-A-S-H, at gmail.com. What's your blog called? Uh, well, what's it called won't be helpful because, uh, yeah, like it, it would be hard to find. Um, but 